It's the same hustle, it's the same pain. Same tears on the replay. Maybe one day we will see we're one big family, like it's one at all. Great day, great day, and welcome to Discussions with Indigenous Education. I'm your host, Tavis Sanders, also known as Red Tail Hawk. I'd like to welcome our co-host and my mother, Red Silver Fox, also known as Renee Sanders. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. <laughs> How y'all doing today? So again, you know, this is episode two of a new a program that we are doing for on a weekly basis down here at IPAN. That's the Indigenous Peoples Artisan Marketplace, 1608 Ridge Ave, Philadelphia. We'd like to say thank you for allowing us to be here to uh, showcase our works and our information and definitely we would like for you to support if you can if you're in the area and I uh, will do a show introducing the owner and talk about some of the things that she's trying to do with this space for indigenous community and you know the community at large in this local area this is a great thing and so discussions with indigenous education will be different topics that moms and I right was going to talk about and is not going to be the tailored educational style of program that y'all used to get from us. Uh, although we definitely hope that you still get some great information from us and definitely some perspectives that maybe sometimes we can't share because of the educational style that we like to share our information with. And so uh, today's topic is, well, today's discussion is going to be centered on what does it mean to be indigenous? And uh, yeah, <laughs> my, that's a loaded question. My mom hit me. Yes. <laughs> Mom's hit me with that question. I said, "Oh, that's a great question," but we can go into so many different spaces and so many different concepts and ideologies centered around that, depending on you know the indigenous community that you come from. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, we figured, you know what? Let us share that space from a you know black indigenous perspective i'm going to use the term black right or from our perspective from our perspective right <laughs> as a melanated indigenous population from the americas right from north america particularly right because uh there will be other black people of course that will have a different perspective than what we have you know right. and so everyone has their their individual uh thoughts about this yes <laughs> But y'all know how I feel about my mom, and I feel like we need to hear what she has to say hmm. about this situation here. <laughs> um, and again, it's about perspectives. It's about, you know, listening to people share um, what they've learned, share their concepts, and even share what they're, what they're doing as a part of that, that, the answer to that question. What does it mean to be indigenous, right? And so before we get started, I would like to acknowledge our online community. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, showing up today. Uh, if you're interested, we do uh, film this live. And so you are welcome to come down and be a part of our audience here. And uh, for those that are unable to attend the live audience review, you can uh, check us out online. And so um, so let's get started. You know, again, you know, we want to keep it light. You know, we just want to have a discussion centered around the conversation uh, but I guarantee you, me and mom's conversation is going to go somewhere. <laughs> and so let's ask mom, you know, I mean, again, you know, uh, it's a loaded question, but it can be simple. It can be as simple as you want it to be. What does it mean to be indigenous to you? For You know, I guess not for you, but in general, what does it mean to be indigenous? Uh, again, yes, very, very loaded question. <laughs> and, and not a very simple one to come up with a, a simple answer. Uh, but one that I can think of is just living in harmony, living in harmony with the planet, mm. living in harmony with the people, and and being harmonious. <laughs> is that my music background? Yeah, harmony, <laughs> harmony. Well, you know, that's interesting that you would choose that to start this off because, you know, environments, right, is, are a very integral part of the lifestyle and the the living uh, in, harm in harmony with your local environment is something that indigenous communities worldwide practice, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um, you know, again, the, since we want to begin with environment, which is really a great space to start, right? To be indigenous is to come from the land, you know, I'm assuming 
of course, you know, we want to go definition, right? <laughs> it means that you were there, right? And that's where you come from. That's where your ancestors come from. But that connectivity um, and that fluid uh, process of generational transfer of knowledge and uh, I'm going to say practices, whether it will be with the root medicines, with plant life, you know, with uh, the moon and the sun cycles, <laughs> you know, with uh, the planting seasons, all of these things were integrated as a part of that our environment and our local living. And so, um, how- Yeah, so many of us really have to relearn these things because uh, after the Europeans came, that, that they, they stole, they raped the culture mm -hmm. <laughs> away from us. And so many of us don't even have a clue even where to begin to, um, you know, how, how, how do I live indigenously? Mm -hmm. You know, because again, that was, that was all taken from us. Right. So we have to relearn these things. Mm -hmm. and, and the care for the environment, living in harmony with the environment is definitely um, one, uh, a description that you're going to see be advocated amongst indigenous populations worldwide. That's, you know, and I, and I think that that's what we're going to try to do today, really focus on those things that no matter which indigenous community you claim to be come from, and no matter what continent you exist <laughs> exactly. on, these yes. indigenous principles are key principles that help to, you know, uh, help to keep their system safe. As a matter of fact, their system allowed the colonizer system to <laughs> thrive, you know, before we had, you know, machinery, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, uh, you know, even with the pilgrims and them not being able to feed themselves, and so the indigenous populations offered their harvest because, you know, they're, they were being human beings. Yes. You know, sure. how did the indigenous peoples know that, you know what, it's time for us to harvest this food? You know, they, they learned that from their ancestors. They learned that by you know, stay into the practices of the, their rituals, their moon circles, their fire circles, and their calendar months that tell them when the seasons are changing and how to, to be able to live in the environment that you occupy. Again, the, the weather in Georgia is different than the weather in Winnipeg. And so the indigenous community is going to thrive in a different way. They're going to connect with their environment in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also, um, I think people also need to realize that uh, being indigenous, um, there's it's, it's not just, and we have to remember that there are, yes, worldwide, there are indigenous people worldwide. And they're not all the same complexion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they all don't look alike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's dark, there's light, there's very light, there's very dark, there's all different complexions. You know, and so we have to realize that even when we're interacting, that well, we just we just always have to be in harm in the harmony with with everybody that we contact with. Mm -hmm. You know, and just that's just an, an, uh, an important. Yeah, skin color, didn't, skin color doesn't really seem to be an issue with indigenous populations. Not with indigenous populations uh, outside of maybe the United States. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you know, that race thing started here in the United States. Oh, and yes, so the did. prevalence would definitely have radiated amongst, you know, this population. And it was used against, you know, the indigenous populations to prop up that colonial system and so Again, yeah, maybe not the United States, but again, you know, we have indigenous cultures from Europe. You know, they call them um, hills tribes. You know, uh, we got indigenous cultures in Africa, in Australia, in South America, in, in Asia, Asia in, right. in, in Russia, mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in Ukraine. You know, there are right. indigenous people that live in those places. And so, so indigenous doesn't have anything to do with color and, and, or, and or race. Right. I'll put that in quotes. Maybe we'll do a show about this another <laughs> no, time. I'm sure we'll have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. We'll be right back with more discussions with Indigenous education. Greetings. I'm Rez Silver Fox, co-founder of Indeed Indigenous Education. And I would like to invite you to visit indedushop.com. That's I-N-D-E-D-U-S-H-O-P dot com. 
and help support our mission to educate the public of the omitted history of the brown and dark-skinned indigenous population of the Americas. And as always, we would like to thank you for your support. Since we're talking about harmony, we're talking about the environment, we're talking about fellow humans, right? And our respect, our um, um, not just the respect for each other, but the harmony that can be created with the respect, which is an indigenous principles, you know. Um, how do you feel with respect to the overall, I guess I was going to say um, the overall view of indigenous peoples in today's world? Do you think that the mainstream society of the United States truly understand the concept of indigenous? Um, <laughs> well, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and well, and that is because of the history that they have been taught. Mm -hmm. You know, and so if, if, if you don't know the history, then how can you <laughs> even begin to comprehend what that means, mm -hmm. you know, and especially in history, if you've been taught that black people did not exist on this continent before slavery, then then how would people here in America even think that black people could be indigenous here? Mm -hmm. They were they've been taught that <laughs> that we came here <laughs> after after Columbus, after, you know, with the slave trade. So, so with that concept right there. Many people won't, you know, they won't, they, they won't even listen. They'll just dismiss because of the misinformation that they have been taught. Mm. Yeah, so, so, there, so again, you know, we started off with some grounding principles, you know, harmony, environment, you know, care for your fellow man. Um, but we just went into a little bit of the historical aspects of it. You know, have being from a place before the colonial system that is, that before the colonial system took over and, and still being in that space today and, and what that means. And so we can get back and start talking about the historical relevance of, you know, the indigenous populations here and, and maybe some of the reasons why it's difficult for us as a melanated group to identify as indigenous. But let's take a small break. Let's, uh, you know, thank some of our sponsors and uh, then we'll be right back with more of discussions with Indigenous Education. Greetings, and welcome to Indeed's Moments in Indigenous Education, which focuses on historical facts which have been omitted or forgotten. Please join us for today's topic. Today's topic, 18th century propaganda and African slavery. Propaganda is information, ideas, or rumors deliberately spread widely to help or harm a person, group, movement, etc. A word that had just been introduced into the English vocabulary in the early 18th century, but by the end of the century, abolitionists were using this tactic widely as it provided results. At the end of the 18th century, slavery had become a very hot topic in politics here and abroad. While the newly forming United States depended on slavery to fund the colonies, abolitionist views were becoming more widespread and abolitionist subcultures began to emerge. One such group was the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade, a British abolitionist group formed in May of 1787 in London, England. The society worked to educate the public about the abuses of the slave trade by writing and publishing anti-slavery books and pamphlets and creating abolitionist prints and posters. Their most infamous print is the image of the Brooks, an 18th century British slave ship. The Plymouth chapter of the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade acquired detailed measurements of the Brooks, including deck plans, cross sections, and side views. The abolitionists inserted images of prone black people to demonstrate the possibility of how they could be situated. It was a hypothetical illustration, an image that requires one to think what life is like when people are stored this way. 
It was an image that could carry its message into the minds of those who did not read the society's literature. Images had rarely been used as a propaganda tool in this way before. This image became one of the first political posters. This propaganda was so effective that it has lasted for centuries. It has sparked our imaginations to create images like this. It has also allowed our psyches to be so empathetic to African slavery that it clouds the fact that only 5% of the African slave trade actually took place on United States soil. You have just finished watching Indeed's Moments in Indigenous History. Please join us next time. Peace. Welcome back to Discussions with Indigenous Education. Uh, before the break, we were talking about some of the historical misnomers that prevalent, that's prevalent here in the United States and why it's important for us to know the history of you know, the Americas and the founding of the United States because it actually offers a uh, it offers us a perspective of why it might be difficult for us to connect with some of these indigenous principles and or, or even acknowledge our indigenous heritage that that might flow through some of our uh, our bloodlines and so of course you know that's what we do here let's get a little bit into the historical misnomer some of the information some of the education centered around that and um, I guess I, the first question is, um, why would they have excluded? Why would you want to exclude an indigenous population from being acknowledged or even, yeah, I guess acknowledged because they keep telling me that I don't exist, <laughs> right? So, you know, let's just share some of the reasons why that might happen. And then that might offer the community some of the, uh, some things or some of the, um, things that we can do today to start to reconnect with these indigenous principles, some of which we'll be going over in a few minutes. Well, one thing, like we, like we said previously, uh, is what is written already in the history books. And uh, that when the, uh, when the Europeans arrived here, that, that the people that were here were not black. Mm -hmm. You know, they, uh, they were Indians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, so uh, and Indians aren't black. So, <laughs> right. but again, but that was the concept that they perpetuated. Mm -hmm. when, did that, yeah. when did that concept start being perpetuated? Because hmm. I know it didn't start at the beginning. No, it didn't start at the beginning because when they first got here, they were saying that many of those indigenous people looked like the Africans. Right. right. <laughs> and, and, and they were calling them Africans. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, when, when King Charles even gave permission to import Africans into, uh, into the islands for Columbus, they weren't talking about the Africans from Africa. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They were talking about the black people that were in the surrounding islands and the black people that were on the surrounding mainland. Mm -hmm. They called them mainland Caribs <laughs> mm -hmm. or the island Caribs. And the Caribs were cannibals and they were worthy of being slaves. Wow. Which is interesting now, you know, because now you throw the, the cannibals in there now and now we got to talk about propaganda, right? <laughs> and how useful it has been for the colonial establishment um, up until today, right? <laughs> now they want to talk about propaganda and all of the, the negative connotations that it can be used as now that it's actually being used against the colonial system itself, right? And, and, and trying to break down the republic that they have been organizing for such a long time. Propaganda as a part of the, imp imp like the imprint uh, in our minds of what it meant to be indigenous, you know, savage and yeah, cannibal. And, and, and the thing is, is that the Europeans, they were, they were very good at, at, at propaganda. Mm -hmm. The printing press had just been invented not too long before that in the 1400s. Mm -hmm. And um, they needed a way to, first they, 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 they wanted to get the word of the Bible out to, norm, to regular people. Okay. Once they got it out to regular people, then it's like, 
uh-oh, now if people can read, so now what can we do now? We, and, and so now we need to do things to trick people <laughs> into wanting to do these things. And so they, they, hmm. they, they became very astute in propaganda uh, in the 1500s and especially in the early 1600s when they started printing out their books. And so when, when they started putting their books together, they had already been experienced in the religious propaganda that they had been using. And so now it's like, okay, well now we know how to use this propaganda. So now we can, we, we know how to turn, turn to these people and make them be something that they're not. Mm. And then continue to teach them that. <laughs> <laughs> Until they become what we tell them that they are. You, you continue to tell the lie when the lie becomes the truth. Print the truth. <laughs> and that's that's a quote from... That was a movie, uh, a John Wayne movie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> I was like, that sounds like a quote from somebody. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, um, I wanted to start to... I wanted to get into something that you actually uh, helped to organize for us. Um, which are what we like to call the 10 indigenous commandments. Just, you know, uh, statements and, and thoughts that we think will help individuals connect to the indigenous principles and be able to have that life, you know, and be able to, to make those decisions on a daily basis that's going to, you know, start to bring back some of those cultures, some of that tradition and things like that. Yes, now there, there is, now people will see that there is something out there that is called the uh, the Ten Native American Commandments, mm -hmm. um, and they they're great. Uh, however, I thought that there needed to be a little bit more in in them, so um, I started you know researching through them at the end. Those were ten that I thought. Now some of them are from the uh, the 10 Native American commandments. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, so some people will recognize some of them, but some of them are not. Okay. And again, I, they were just things that I felt that values that we could live by. We'll be right back with more discussions with indigenous education. The, the discussion today is about, you know, what does it mean to be indigenous? And so uh, let's go online and let's see, I'm gonna read some of the comments and then uh, I think that we have one person that, that wanted to share something. And so um, let me see some of the comments are, let me see. Um, Living indigenous will require unlearning colonizer systems, i.e. religion, social constructs, and et cetera. And that's coming from Ms. White. And so did you wanna, what do you feel about that statement? Uh, that's right along the lines of what I was also saying. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. So thank you, Miss White, for that. Um, we have one, another one. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> here's a, uh, I'm, my apologies. It kind of knocked me off. This is a, a child's answer. Her answer is uh, short and sweet. Being a dirty baby, she always played in the dirt as a child and knows her connection to the soil. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, again, she wants to dirt connect. Baby, not dirt baby. Oh, dirt baby. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I need to put my glasses on, my apologies. <laughs> um, but again, you know, again, that's that harmony connecting to the, the earth, to the ground. And as a matter of fact, if y'all don't mind me sharing, um, you know, I'm always into reading about science and, and stuff like that. And they actually did a um, uh, a, a scientific research study on clean versus dirty children. And they, you know, children that are, that have parents that don't allow them to play in the dirt, that are very strict with respects to, you know, washing the hands all of the time and really not allowing their children to be children, they actually wind up sicker <laughs> than the children that play outside, that get to play in the grass, they might eat a little dirt or a worm every now and then. <laughs> that was me. Won't hurt you. And so it's interesting, you know, that again, even the concept of connecting with the ground is going to help your immune system. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, again, indigenous principles that take you away from, you know, colonizers way of thinking that, you know, everything has to be clean all of the time. Everything has to be neat and pressed and, you know, it has to be organized in a, in a way that we've created it. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about concrete. You know, we can't just, it can't just be a dirt road. You know, we had to create concrete because we need, we wanted to, to be, be able to walk on something that man made, not something that, you know, earth made. Um, you know, I don't know. I guess that's my issue with coloni colonization. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. So that's a great point. Thank you very much. I think we had a few more. What does it mean to ind uh, be indigenous? Miss uh, Miss Annette says, a feeling being where I have a right to be. You know, and so that's very interesting, particularly coming from, you know, the historical mm -hmm. diasporic, um, you know, uh, educational uh, platform where, you know, uh, well, not for me, but uh, growing up, but a lot of my friends, you know, it's like, I'm from here, but I ain't going back to Africa either. And so mm -hmm. where do I belong? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and if you connect with that in this, your indigenous, uh, your, your indigenous roots, again, no matter what your shade or what your color, no matter what your language is, you know, you can have something to connect to that that will offer you not only an opportunity to learn about that land and the ancestors and the history of that, but also something to look forward to and being able to share with your children or maybe even connect with some cultures or traditions that help you feel good and that you want to restart for your ancestors, right? Okay. Yeah. So any more in here? Okay. We have one more. A feeling of being where I belong and where I have the right to be. That's, mm -hmm. that's a much more uh, organized statement. Thank you very much. And I guess I could say that too. Um, when I go to DC, mm -hmm. when I, and anytime I go to the DC, North Virginia area, I feel like I'm home and I love it there. You know, it just, I just want to be there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I guess that's something that is just permeated through my bloodline. Yeah, you just—it's just—it's just, it's just, it's just uh, all those sparks inside of you are just <laughs> <laughs> sparking up and and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, DNA activation is real, right? You know, they—they mm -hmm. they call it clickers. Um, if you into science like that, you know they—you uh, know—they talk about even the clickers happening at a uh, even in the womb. You know, mm -hmm. where different stages different DNA nodes will activate, you know, and they're trying to figure out how do how does the human system know when to activate this particular DNA that will release this particular information into the bloodstream to make you grow your fingers, to make you grow your ears and, and things like that. Um, and so, again, indig indigenous principles being as though we're all interconnected, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Um, we're about to take another short break so that we can thank our sponsors again. And when we get back, we'll start to um, share some of the uh, 10 indigenous commandments. And um, then we can get some more, uh, hear some more information, some more insight from you. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you all very much. We hope that you are enjoying the show so far. Stay tuned and we'll be right back with more of Discussions with Indigenous Education. We would like to thank our sponsors. Somebody found working fingers to the bone. 